guys, it's Jackie. I'm from Masters of Malaysian Cuisine. Welcome to another session in our Malaysian Heritage Cuisine series. We're very, very excited this time around to have Liam Ghani, who is our guest chef in MOMC. Liam, great to have you. How are you? Hi, fantastic. Thank you very much for having me. This is going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. And yeah, it's such an honor to be here to share this recipe with you guys. No, no, no. We're really excited to see what you have to offer. Guys, uh, Liam is the Penang boy in our MOMC universe. So he's always got a very interesting take on Malaysian cuisine. And also he's based in South Africa as well, which is a double whammy. So uh, a Penang boy in South Africa trying to attempt to, uh, to replicate Malaysian flavors faithfully. It can be a little bit of a challenge, but we're keen to see what he's going to do today. So what's your heritage cuisine choice, Liam? Ah, it's a special one for me. Siamese laksa. It's something for my, my grandmother used to make, who is Burmese Chinese or was Burmese Chinese. And so it's really special to me to actually make this dish for you guys. And what's great about it too, is that my grandmother did not really write recipes down. So many of her good best recipes were lost after she passed away but my aunt very kindly uh, wrote this recipe down while she was still alive and gave it to me for this um oh. event so i'm really excited by this so yeah it's got a good oh. personal touch yeah 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 no we're gonna have to dive into that a little bit more but uh by the way guys i know it's called siamese laksa but it's actually a malaysian dish all right yeah. <laughs> and it's yes. also known yes. as yeah did you say it's also called penang laksa lama yes yes Okay. Basically, cool. it's a bit of a hybrid between uh, laksa, uh, asam laksa and a regular laksa lemak. So it's basically a fishy version of a coconut-based laksa. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, basically, that's basically the sum. Yeah. So. I think that's actually my favorite Penang uh, laksa, actually, in all honesty. Um, but anyway. Yeah. Um, no one suit me. I'm not a huge fan of asam laksa. I have to be honest. I, uh, I think it was when I was a kid and you were like presented this bowl of brown, black <laughs> sardines. <laughs> it never quite did it for me. I've tasted it since and it is amazing. But as a kid, it was never my go-to choice. So this was a good mix between the two for me. I totally agree. I'm with you on that, actually. I mean, I didn't really eat asam laksa until I grew up because I grew up in that part of Malaysia where Penang asam laksa wasn't really a thing sort of things. Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, guys, I'm going to give Liam uh, the full screen and but you'll be able to hear me in the meantime as well. Okay, so how are you going to go about this, Liam? Okay, so first things first, um, like all good hawker dishes, it's a dish of a number of different parts. And none of them particularly complicated but it does take a little bit of time and prep to get this ready. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna poach our fish. So I've just un over here got some water, which I'm just gonna bring back up to the boil. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna ask you what kind of fish you're using. Okay, now this is the tricky part. Traditionally, you would use um, Spanish mackerel, um, chub mackerel, um, Ikan pangan is another one, which I think is quite a funny name for a fish, <laughs> machete fish, but anyway. Um, so, and the other option too is lemon sole, it's quite a good one. So I've kind of tried to combine a couple of different fishes together to get a similar taste because you want a slightly oily fish. Um, so I'm actually using lemon sole and a couple of sardines as well. So oh, I'm nice. gonna, that gives me a little bit of a blend, a little bit of a mix. Um, yeah, because mackerel is quite difficult to get here out of season because um, mackerel would be ideally the best Spanish mackerel. Um, so to the poaching, what we're going to do is we're going to add, so I'm just bringing some water up to boil here. I'm just going to turn down because obviously we want to poach the fish, not boil it. I've got some ginger, fresh ginger. I'm going to add to that. I've got a teaspoon of salt that as well. And I've also got a little bit of tamarind paste. Now, Traditionally, you would actually use, let me just get from this, you would actually use asam kaping, um, but that we unfortunately is way out of my reach in South Africa. I plan to next time I go back to Malaysia to buy a bit and bring it back with me. Um, but otherwise, tamarind paste will work just as well. Sure. So I'm just put that in and I'm just going to let the tamarind just dissolve a little bit. So all we're going to do, like I said, is we're just going to poach the fish lightly for about 10 minutes or until it becomes a bit flaky. And then we will basically flake the fish afterwards. So I'm just going to reduce that down. There we go. 
and I'm just going to add my fishes in. So you've got one of those. Okay, cool. That's a okay. fillet. Is it? Uh, no, actually, still on the bone. Um, okay. so this is actually why I quite like using sole because it's very easy to bo um, once it's actually cooked, it comes off the bone very easily. Um, so okay. you're not fiddling with many bones and things. Sure, sure. I like how your wooden spoon's got a hole in the middle. Is that a thing? Because I, I know, saw. I love my little wooden spoon. It seems counter. It seems counterintuitive, but it's actually yeah. great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I saw. Spoon. First time I saw that was with Her Majesty Queen Aziza when she did her live with us, and she had a wooden spoons that had like these smiley, um, you know, faces well, carved. If you actually want to mix stuff, this type of spoon actually works really well. So if you've got a sauce, obviously the edge at the side here is great for actually getting around okay. the side of a pot. And also it agitates the sauce as well whilst you're moving it. So it's not more, so not so much like a paddle, but more no. of an agitator. Um, plus it looks okay. really cool. Come on. So everyone's <laughs> got to get themselves one of these. <laughs> that okay. makes sense. So that's just poaching away. Um, whilst that's poaching, like I said, about 10 minutes, we will first go and do our paste. So like all laksas, this has a uh, spice paste, very similar, nothing too unusual. Um, I'm just going to get that tray quickly. Okay, so what have we got? So um, shallots uh, would be ideal. Um, in South Africa, it can be a little bit tricky. So I tend to use half white onion, half red onion just to get a little bit of sweetness in there and a bit of body as well. So I've got half of, uh, half of each of those. I've got two cloves of garlic. I've got a nice little wedge of ginger. I've got some red chilies, which I grew in my own garden. Check these out. I'm so chuffed with myself. <laughs> Very nice. I couldn't be prouder of my chilies. I've got some turmeric. Um, you can also use fresh turmeric as well. I've got about 10 dried chilies, which I've just snipped, uh, de-seeded. I just snipped them into little pieces, de-seeded them, and soaked them in some hot water. I've also got some lemongrass as well. And lastly, arguably most importantly, a little bit of lachan to go in as well. So all we're going to do is let me just keep this controlled. OK. No, we're going to blend all this together. Malaysia or in South Africa? Sorry, say that again? Did you get the balachan in Malaysia or in South Africa? Oh, this is my Malaysian stash. <laughs> my very precious Malaysian stash. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult to get a Malaysian balachan in South Africa. Um, the closest we tend to get is the Thai version, um, which some of the Thai versions are a little bit wetter. Well, they're all a little bit wetter, but there are a couple yeah. of brands where it's almost similar, but not quite the same. But, but for sure. a good old heritage dish, we've got to have proper balachan. And the smell, oh, gotta love it. Exactly. Okay. So all we're gonna do is we're just gonna chop these up. I like to use a hand blender. Um, I find it, especially for a small amount of paste like this, if you use a larger um, food processor, it will push every, the centrifuge will push everything out to the side. So you don't get such a nice blend. So I find it's a little bit more direct using something a bit smaller for this. So we're just gonna, Roughly chop onions. So, like I said, if you can get hold of shallots, they would be first prize. Um, but to be honest, it doesn't actually, in, in, in the great scheme of things, it's one of the things you should worry about the least, quite frankly. Um, garlic, we're just going to chop this up. Yeah, for, for for the longest time now, I've just straight out used brown onions here in Australia. I, I, I'm not no. as uh, much a perfectionist as you are. I can tell he's a no, perfectionist. And then I say too, um, if you shouldn't really use just red onion as well because the sugar content's too high and you actually end up, um, you can burn your paste a little bit too and caramelize it. And yeah, so oh, I find cool. a mixture is red. mixture or just or just brown onion. Nice. Okay. Okay. I'm going to mute myself for a little bit because somebody's car alarm is going off. So uh, if you okay. don't hear me, no think, that's fine. But I'll hop in <laughs> in a little bit.
Okay, so that goes our ginger, our lemongrass. Now I've actually taken the, gonna take these husks off again. You want to get to the nice soft center. But don't throw these away. No, -uh, don't throw them away. You're just gonna, you're gonna keep these for the aromatics later on. Um, because again, it just adds that little bit extra flavor. So we're just gonna just roughly chop these up. Wait. Okay, get rid of those woody ends. Put that into there. Okay. Our soaked chilies. Like I said, I'm using about 10. Um, but by all means, this is really to your own taste. Um, a word of advice though. I'm using actually um, dried chilies from Malaysia, which tend to be a lot milder than a lot of the dried chilies you get elsewhere. So, you know, I may be using 10, your chilies that you may get dried wherever you're from may be much hotter. So, you know, go with what you know. Um, just like these red chilies here, my very proud red chilies, they may look big and scary, but actually they're quite mild. So we're gonna put in. How long did it take for your um, chili plants to to grow chilies? Uh, about two months. Are you serious? That no, can't be I right. Know. I, I must be honest, I must be honest, I, in my new garden, for some reason, I seem to have scored on this nice little spot for Malaysian stuff. It's so awesome. I mean, I've been growing this, I've got some Thai basil. Um, I've got, let me show you what else I've got. This is super exciting to me too. Um, I've been able to grow my own Thai lime leaves, oh, which is no. quite interesting. Um, wow. I've been doing my own down, uh, my uh, down capsule no, as well, yeah. leaf, which I'm well. very, really impressed by. Um, so just put that out there. And I'm even growing some kangkong, which is the best thing ever for me. And also um, some down kaduk, which surprises me that's still going, but. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Winter's coming, so I may have to have a bit of a rush of using all these things before winter comes. Do they you know, die because they winter? winter? Yeah, because I, I tried, I mean, the only thing that's really succeeded for me are like Thai basil and down, uh, down kasum, the laksa leaves. Everything yeah. else is like just struggling along. Was, I've got I know. It's, it's, it's finding that sweet spot I've discovered. I mean, I'm no gardener. <laughs> Let me say this now. Whatever's happening out there is purely <laughs> by chance. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. No, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm a great planner of gardens. I'm not a great keeper gardener alive kind of person. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we've got our blood chan, which we've added. We've got our um, turmeric paste. I'm not going to add the turmeric paste yet. I'm going to mix this up and then add the turmeric paste later. Um, simply for the reason I don't want to stain my um, mixer and it's not really necessary. And what's quite nice too is that um, when you actually blend it up and then add some um, ground spices afterwards, it actually helps dry out the paste a little bit. So I'm just going to mix this up. I'm just going to add a little bit of oil just to help things along. Um, again, you can use water if you like. I just prefer a bit of oil. Sure. I'm just going to go over here. Quickly put them in the top. Done. I'm impressed at how well you managed to blend that with your yeah. blender. Again, it's, it's actually what you need to do when you do it. You actually need to use the stick blender um, vertically. 
So you just need to sort of lift it up, lift it up, lift it up, and it creates pockets of air and pulls it back down again. So it enables, enables you to actually really get it to sort of all melt together. Um, nice. My, my poor Good. stick blender gets used for nothing else, I must be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, spice makers. Okay. That's interesting. Because okay. I've got a Thermomix and I use a Thermomix for everything, but um, I've got a stick blender as well that's heavily underutilized. I might pull it out one day. Oh, you know, when you've got a Thermomix lying around, the poor stick blender gets forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> okay. Got my turmeric, which I'm going to add to that. Cool. Okay. And I'm just going to mix that in. So. You know, you're not the first Penang Nyonya with Burmese heritage. That's because oh, really? I, I, well, yeah, I, I mean, I sound surprised, but I'm sure I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I, yeah, I, I never imagined Burma having an influence on Malaysia's like ethnic mix. Well, to any degree. in Penang, there is a large. Um, Burmese community, again, we have a, um, in Plotikus, there is the Thai um, temple and it opposite the Burmese temple. So the right? Burmese temple there has always played a huge part in my childhood because I've obviously got a lot of relatives who are from Burmese Chinese. And yeah, I used to go all the time there for their water festivals. And yeah, in fact, my great, great, my great grandmother is buried at the behind behind one of those um, churches, not churches. Sorry, <laughs> she's buried behind one of those um, temples. Which yeah, so right. it's very, but, but it does have a big influence, certainly. Um, okay. So, but your dad is Malay, though. My father is actually um, a, a bit of a mixture, um, obviously, but Malay, uh, Indonesian, Chinese, Burmese. <laughs> I, okay. I think it's probably the closest that we can get to. Um, but my family is, is literally the definition of multicultural. <laughs> um, nice. Even before my mother came along to add a little bit of Irish into the mix, um, it was very much a melting pot and only yeah. has become more and more so as time has gone on. And yeah, it's always quite funny when you go back to Malaysia and you look at my family, you think, wow. <laughs> it's this. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, we're very mixed and very proud of it, and yeah, very proud of all the heritage that it brings us as well. So, so we've done our paste. Now the fish. The fish is actually cooked through. So I'm just going to take this off. Okay, so I'm going to turn that chat off for a second. So with the so, sardine, does it have a lot of bones in it? Like, would you have trouble deboning it? The sardine is slightly more of a problem than the sole. Um, but we'll see how we go. Um, to be honest, the sardine in this instance is actually really more for the stock than anything okay. else. I just wanted to get that slightly oily fish flavor, but we'll see how we go with it. Um, gotcha. Okay, so there's our poached fish ready to go. And then we're gonna strain the stock, which will go into our laksa gravy later. Okay. Yeah. So. I'm going to take this. Oops, there we go. I'm just going to put that stock to one side. Let's get the cloth. It's just. Okay, so now we're going to fake the fish. I may cry. They may be. It may be a bit hot. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, so once again, you want to flake them off quite big flakes. Now, the sole is absolutely not a problem. I always think sole fish bones look like a cartoon fish. You know that sort of classic, perfectly formed. Yeah, yeah it really is. Hang on, I'm just gonna flip it over. Oh, oh it's hot. See, that's what we're taking. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what it's amazing. Uh, cartoon bones. <laughs> oh, <it's hot. laughs> so you like? Did you remove the head before you used the fish, oh, or did dressed, it come without the head? I'm using dressed sole, um, so it will come without the head and the sides as well. 
because obviously a sole is a flat fish, and they will trim off the wings, as it were, and the head for you. Um, gotcha. Right. So we're just going to pop that one in. Flip that over. Oh. So is sole expensive in South Africa, or...? Uh, surprisingly not actually um, it's not one of our it's not one of our more um, common fish um, but no it's actually not that bad um, to be honest the most expensive types of fishes you get here really are tuna and salmon um, which is fine is kind of to be expected the tuna is a little galling because um, off the South African coast we have some of the best tuna in the world um, but sadly it doesn't really make its way to South African, dish, um, South African plates very often. The best anyway, it gets shipped off straight to Tokyo and to uh, places okay. where have a lot more money. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, well the sardine is actually coming off pretty well, I have to say, I'm quite, quite nice. impressed. I may never feel yeah, my fingers ever right. again after this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's all for the good, okay. It's a clever idea to mix sardine with sole, actually. I never thought of that. Yeah, because, you know, sardine on its own would be too overpowering. Obviously, compared to mackerel which or um, chub mackerel or Spanish mackerel, yeah. um, it's a little bit more full-on flavoured. But again, if you just temper it a bit, because um, I have to say some of my worst Assam laksas have literally felt like someone got a tin of sardines, threw it in. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. So, yeah. Most Malaysians that I know who attempt to make asam laksa just do that. They just open a can yeah. of sardines in no, tomatoes. Which, again, you can, by all means. It's not, um, it's just sometimes you want to put a little bit of effort in, you know, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And again, yeah. I think it's in Malaysia when you sort of think, oh, you know what, I'm lazy. I don't want to go out to get it. I'm just going to mm. knock it together myself. You know, yeah. I think when you live away from Malaysia, you tend to be slightly more pedantic about what you want to do because. You know, you want to, people to experience food and, you know, when you're cooking for people, you want to sort of get them the best flavours that you can give them. So yeah, that's yeah. our flake bits, which I'm just going to keep over here. So, next thing, we're going to fry our paste. So, this, okay, not too hot. So, I've got about four tablespoons of oil, which I'm going to add in there. Okay, so we're just going to let this come up and heat it up a bit. Okay. So to be honest, that's pretty much the hard work. <laughs> the rest of it's pretty easy. Really, you're just actually um, bringing the gravy together, adding ingredients. This you know, it was, I mean, I looked at the recipe in this for this and I thought, my goodness, it seems like a lot of elements and things going on, but each individual element is actually very straightforward. And you're yeah. gonna get a really nice authentic taste at the end of it too. Okay, so let's add this in. So I've got a little bit of pile of dishes building up behind me already. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there's a clean dish in this house. <laughs> I think I've literally used everything for this. <laughs> no, I don't believe that, Liam. I've seen your stacks and stacks. You've of seen my prep. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a prep with note. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're just going to saute this off. Now, obviously, like all rumpers, you don't want to have the heat too high uh, because it may burn it before it actually will separate. So what you're aiming for is to cook the onion through and to um, bring out the oils. Um, the oils and the flavors will meld and basically separate. So you want to fry this until it becomes very fragrant and you start getting um, a separation of oil and paste. And it will go a little bit darker as well. Um, but like I said, I'm so pleased I've got this recipe. Um, so many of my grandmother's dishes sadly were lost with her. Um, but my aunt, who is a famous food writer in Malaysia, Rahani Jalani, she took it upon herself really to actually look at res these recipes. And, and my aunt as well, my other aunt, um, Jan, was very good at actually making sure you got the information. Because my grandmother was a very bad cook. <laughs> Not a very bad um, person to teach you how to cook, sorry, very good cook. But she was very aga aga. So 
it was always like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I'm sure when you were distracted, it was like a little bit of this over here, which you can't see. And yeah, so <laughs> she was a little bit protective about her recipes. <laughs> Is that right? Interesting. But very much cooked by flavor. Um, but unfortunately, yeah. she passed away before I actually really wanted to learn how to make Malaysian food. Um, but certainly, I do remember very well going to the market with her, and we used to go to Plotikus quite a lot. And yeah, but it, it, going to the market with my grandmother was always interesting. She would start with the flowers and the veggies, and it would get smellier and smellier <laughs> as, <laughs> as the visit went on. Eventually, you would end up in the meat section and the fish section. Yeah, but she always started you off well with nice, pretty things. <laughs> <laughs> so they <are> you in. <laughs> Now, you can add a little bit more oil. Sorry, okay. what's that, Jackie? I've, I've been to Pilaticus Market. It's really nice. Like it's lovely. It, it's small. It's not a big market, but it's very. It's perfectly full. I have to say. I, I look. I'm a little biased because that's my childhood market. So, <laughs> but yeah. And at night, oh my goodness, the hawker stalls there were the best. Absolute best. Oh, I need to check that out. Okay. But this time is not so. While that's frying away, I'm just going to chat to you about the aromatics that we're going to put into this. Okay. So obviously we've got our paste. We're going to add the fish stock to the paste, and then to that, this is what we've got. Okay. So, firstly, we've got uh, more tamarind paste, uh, about okay. two tablespoons. Again, asam kaping if you can get it, but tamarind paste is fine. Um, I've got about two teaspoons of sugar, uh, um, and about two tablespoons of, sorry, two tablespoons of sugar and two teaspoons of salt. I've got our lemongrass husks, which I reserved from earlier, which I'm just gonna give a little bit of a crush. I've got my lima purut leaves, my high lime leaves, which are, oh, I'm so proud of my growing these at home. We just get a little stir, you know, it down a bit. Always watch your spice paste. <laughs> it will burn, it will turn and burn on you in a second if you're not careful. Okay. Um, I've also got my laksa leaves, which again from my garden, I was very proud of myself. And lastly, um, torch ginger. So torch ginger is hard, very hard to find in, outside Malaysia. Um, so I actually have a dried version, which I'm going to add as well. Um, it just gives a lovely fragrance to the whole thing. And some coconut, um, I've got some coconut cream, uh, not coconut milk, okay. coconut cream. So okay. those are the aromatics that are going to go in once my white paste comes up. Okay. So this is starting to actually dry out a little bit and the oil starting to separate. And oh, yeah, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the magic of Blachan, it has to be said. I, life without Blachan would be a very sad life indeed. Uh, yeah. We need to get more Blachan, Malaysian Blachan to South Africa by the sounds of we it. We do. We really do. And the thing is, I think with Blachan, the trick is, is you've, got to, you've actually got to cook it and feed people things with Blachan. Because <laughs> as an ingredient, it's quite repugnant to a lot of people. A bit like durian, people have an immediate reaction to it. But obviously, yeah. we all know that you know that's not really the case. So, yeah, I think the more blachan I can surreptitiously serve people, <laughs> the better. <laughs> totally agree. Okay, so I'm going to pour in my stock now. Bring this up a bit closer. You know, the first time I had this dish was um, when I visited Ketloksi Temple in Penang. And yeah. I was told that Penang Asam Laksa at the base of Kaloksi Temple, there's this famous place that does the best Penang Asam Laksa. And I went to check it out and I noticed that they not only had Penang Asam Laksa, but they also had this. And I decided to order one of each because I'm greedy. And I really <laughs> thought this was like much, much nicer than the Penang Asam Laksa. So this is my favorite. I, I'm with you. Look, I think it's, it's again, it's that reassuring richness which it yeah. has, which I, I think is really nice. Um, okay, so yeah. we're not going to add the coconut cream yet. That's going to go in a bit later. 
We're first going to add our ar ar aromatics as this comes to the boil. Okay, so add my torch ginger in. Add tamarind paste. Okay. Salt. I like that your little ramekins or whatever they're called have like they're like little spoons. <laughs> I, I am the pointless little plate king, just so you know. <laughs> I have drawers of the stuff. <laughs> okay, then I've got my lime leaves, which I'm just gonna fold over, give it a little bit of a crack here and there, even just a little tear, just to release some of the flavor. Nice. Because again, it's all about the oils. Oh, see immediately. Oh, is there anything better? <laughs> that smell always reminds me of otta otta. Just that lovely, yeah. lovely, fizzy smell. Okay. Our laksa leaves going in. And I'm going to add two of these. And so I'm, again, just going to give it a little bit of a break. Sure. So, boiling, so I'm just going to reduce that down to a bit of a simmer. I'm just going to move this out of the way. Oh, I'm, out of I'm dying to know what sort of noodles you're going to use for this. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, it's quite, quite an adventure. Make, I actually made my own noodles. Um, nice. <laughs> which is nice. quite an adventure. Um, laksa noodles aren't very easily available here. Um, the closest we can find are udon, um, which is okay. odd because udon obviously is a wheat noodle. But in terms yeah. of texture and look, it's the most similar yeah. we can find. Um, right. So I thought I, in honor of Malaysian ingredients and doing it right, I made my own laksa noodles. Um, uh, yes, it, it was a little bit, as they say in the UK, very blue Peter here earlier. I had my um, cookie, my what you call them, it's like a cookie press over hot yeah, yeah. water. And yeah, it was a mess. <laughs> it was a mess. We got there in the end, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we just going to let this come up to boil. Okay. So. Next thing we're going to look at. So we're going to add some of our fish back in. You want to keep some of the fish aside for actually um, to just put on top of the dish because obviously fish flakes are going to break down a bit in the sauce. So I'm just yep. going to take some of my, just a mixture, a little bit of the sole, a few nice bits of sardines. And the rest, we're just going to pop in there. Okay. There we go. Oh, so good. Okay, so we're just going to let that simmer for a couple of minutes before we add our coconut cream. Okay, then I'm going to just quickly run you through the toppings. Now, as we all know, noodles are nothing without toppings. So this is where the line between the two dishes, asam laksa and um, Siamese laksa, start to actually blend a little bit more. So, yeah. what we've got here, um, we've got cucumber, we've got some red onion, another one of my lovely chilies, um, a lime, some pineapple, a bit of mint. I've also got some... Um, deep fried shallots as well. Um, I like to have that in it just for that little bit of texture and crunch. And then my favorite part, some diluted heko sauce. So anyone who doesn't know what heko sauce is, it's a um, prawn caramel, for lack of a better word. Um, so That's I'd never made this before. And I found a recipe on Jackie's website and tried it. And wow, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my life has changed. Um, so, and I'm a great, I'm a great person for telling people never throw your prawns away. And that was before I discovered how to make this. Now, really, if, if you're going to throw them away, send them to me <laughs> and I'll make heck of it. It's totally worth it. I mean, I made roja the other day. I made this. Oh, so good. So good. Anyway, it's not, it's not difficult to make me a happy man. <laughs> okay. I'm going to add in the coconut cream now. Oh. So I'm using about 180 mils worth. Um, That's a very thick coconut cream. Sorry? 
That's a very thick coconut cream. It's almost like a... It is. I, I cheated. <laughs> so I actually, instead of buying a small thing of coconut cream, I actually like to keep some of the coconut, tins of coconut, where it's solidified at the top. So that yeah. is basically oh, coconut wow. cream. So I actually get to take that out. It's a little bit more potent than the stuff that you would buy ordinarily, yeah. but it's very condensed. But yeah, so sometimes, I mean, That's I remember when I first started cooking, I used to get so annoyed whenever I used to get a tin of coconut milk that solidified. Because you would sit there and you'd mix it and mix it and mix it. Yeah, now yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, but I must have gone through 20 tins of coconut milk till I found one that solidified. <laughs> Like I didn't open them all. I did. I just did the little uh -huh. sort of check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that comes up. Now, obviously, with dishes like this, if you can leave it to rest for a while, oh, it's going to be so much better. It's going to be amazing as it is. But if you just give it a couple of hours, if you just just sitting on its own or overnight in the fridge. Just like any curry flavors, any laksa flavors, they're going to meld given time to actually calm down, come together. And, but yeah, you can eat it straight away. But if you've got the time, just put it aside for a little. Um, okay, so that went hey. away. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is I'm just going to put some water on for a second. Just give me one minute. One second. Sure. And everyone, don't forget, if you want the recipe for this, you can sign up at malaysianchefs.com slash join today. And we will have an exclusive e-magazine prepared for this series in particular, containing all these recipes. And Liam is my, my editor for this, actually. <laughs> I, am. I am. I love it. I love editing. <laughs> Who knew? Oh. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> uh, you know, you give me an yeah, idea. Yeah. Nice little fun to play with, and I'm a happy man. <laughs> oh my god, it's all yours, Liam. I know, <laughs> I know. Jackie's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to bring this down to a soft simmer now. Now we don't want to overboil it at this stage. Obviously, we've added the coconut milk, so you don't want to risk splitting it. Um, so just sure. a nice little gentle simmer, just to keep it going and warm. In the meantime, I put on some water to just blanch my laksa noodles. Sure. So. These are my homemade laksa noodles. I'm not sure if you can oh, really no, see them too well. They don't no, look they're bad. Not. They're a little short. I must say, they're a little short, but they're springy. They're nice. They're not bad. Sure. And, you yeah. know, if we're, I'm trying to find the longest one possible to, so I can look impressive. But, <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. But they do work and they taste pretty, they taste pretty good. Um, so we're just going to prepare our toppings now. Okay, so... First things first, just our lime, which we're going to squeeze over. So always give your limes a little bit of a bash, a little bit of a roll. And cool. yeah, if cutting limes too, ideally you want to cut it along the side, not you don't want to cut it across the way. You want to actually cut it along along the way. So mm, nice some fresh lime. We're going to have a little bit of green chili. So we're just going to finely slice these. Okay. Same with the red onion. Okay, so it's going to go inside there. Okay. Let's get those bits. Okay, pineapple, we're just going to shred slightly. Oh yeah, Malaysian pineapple is a is um, something that Mafi is looking to introduce to Australia. I believe so. Yes, I believe so. I believe it's amazing. Um, yeah, again, I, I, I'm looking forward to. I hope after watching this, Mafi will start sending a few more things South Africa's way. Yeah. There's a market here. I'm telling you now, South Africa is a race Asian food. So, I yeah, please please come, Mafi. <laughs> Do whatever you like, <laughs> because you don't really find many Malaysian ingredients here, to be honest. Um, we did go through a stage where I was over the moon because Lingam's chili sauce arrived, <laughs> but sadly it didn't quite take off. So as quickly as it arrived, it left us again. Oh, no. Um, 
I know. So I know but this is a meeting way. with uh, yeah. the Mafi Secretary General, and they explicitly said that Africa is a target market for oh. them to expand into because they see a potential there. There you go. Oh wow! Okay, no, that's that's happy days. Okay, yeah. cucumber. So I'm just cut that off there. So I'm just going to cut these into little into thin rounds. Okay. And then, oh sorry, my runaway cucumber. And I'm just going to take them, stack them on top of each other, and then just cut them at a, on a bias backwards and forwards. So they're like little shards. Um, nice. Go. Now, obviously, when you're preparing all this, you want to keep it um, large enough that you can eat easily with a chopstick, or that also that they're not so big that yeah, so you can get little mouthfuls of flavor each time. Um, nice. Put that there. And again, we've got our lovely echo sauce, and then some mint, which we're just going to put in as well. Okay, so I'm just going to put all this on the plate, and we'll dress it in a minute. Okay, so let me just get rid of this. Okay, let me just see how my pot of water is going. Okay, so these noodles are pre-cooked, um, so all I'm literally going to do, because they've been in an ice bath water, I'm just going to refresh them a little bit in some warm water, uh, sure. in some boiling water, and then bring them back to the bowl. Um, so, sure. let's get these in there. You know, you can buy these noodle molds there on eBay. Well, that's where I get them. Or, and they will help you get longer strands of these noodles. So, oh, really? Oh, no. Yeah. You're, you, oh, no, kitchen gadget. I've got to have it. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's from China, it's only like 20 bucks, to, you know, so wow. it's definitely a good uh -huh. investment. Okay, Christmas list sorted. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, am a, I have to be honest, I'm a sucker for a kitchen gadget. I really am. Um, I think you'll like that. Especially one. The weirder and more wonderful it is, the better. And you throw in some <laughs> you throw in factor, or oh, I think it's that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you have to crank it by hand, it's really suitable for, I guess, you know, if you're cooking for two people, it's not really feasible. If you're making like a whole big pot of noodles for a 20 people or something. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's still, it's still oh, good. Yeah. Well, that, that's the thing when I use the cookie press, again, it's a lever motion, which complicates it because obviously it's only designed to go for so long. So. I was having to release it and then use brute force to actually push it through. The, the lengths Malaysian will go, Malaysians will go to <laughs> to make food. <laughs> quite, it's quite astounding. Okay. That is good, yeah. Quite clever to use a cookie mold. Let me get this out. Okay. So, just going to let that come up to the boil. And we're not cooking them, we're just warming them through. Um, then it's going to give this a bit of a stir and a smell. Hang on. Ah, oh, come on. So good. <laughs> so good. Bring my noodles. Just give them a bit of shake. So let me just get rid of this noodle water. Okay, so got our noodles. Bad choice right. of plate, I'm afraid. Should have actually gone for a slightly darker plate, but it will look good in a second. Don't you worry. <laughs> so we're just going to ladle over. So I'm trying to avoid the herbs. Um, Okay. So just going to, but again, you want some of the fish flakes. You want some of that nice torch ginger as well, which really adds a lovely flavor. You know what I find really interesting growing up in my part of Malaysia, which is down south, where all the laksa is always like the curry laksa that I think most Australians or Westerners are familiar with. Uh, 
I've, I find it fascinating that when you actually travel and research laksa in Malaysia, that in fact most of them are actually fish based sort of thing, like what you oh, just really? did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A lot of the Malay style laksas use like flaked fish as the, the soup base. Well, I suppose you know what, in, in also fish goes a long way. That's that's the one thing. Yeah. It's a, it's in abundance. You know, you can have a lake, you can have the ocean. Um, and it's a good way of making very flavorsome food, which is quite reasonable. Um, again, I, we're looking at two sardines and two pieces of salt. That's all I've used to make. And this is enough for four to six people, depending on how much liquid you put in it. So nice. Um, so I'm just going to dress this bit of my red onions. Okay. What else have we got? Okay. Now, these are my larger fish flakes, which I'm just adding as well. Because this is this is a fancy version. <laughs> if you were to buy this in a, in a local store, you wouldn't be getting fancy flaky bits. But anyway. Um, <laughs> my red chili. That's not some red chili. Uh, and then lastly, my heckles bit. I'm just going to drizzle over the top. Oh, oh nice. Nice touch. Bliss. Absolute bliss. And final flourish of a bit more onions. Let's get that out. Okay. And then let's just rip over my mint leaves. And lastly, Little squeeze of lime. Oh, okay. and there you have it. Right, there we go. I'm not sure oh, how man. well you can see this. Yeah, I can see it now. Looks yeah, beautiful. I've also got another there, so I'm just going to show it over here. But yeah, so th that is my grandmother's um, Siamese laksa, and I'm so I'm and so pleased I was able to share it with you guys. And oh, lunch is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> My lunch is going to be good. Your lunch can be good too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, it's nighttime now here where I am. I'm really jealous. Oh, well, supper. Supper. Come on. Some noodles for supper. You know you want to. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> tempt, don't tempt me. Oh, wow, that looks amazing, Liam. That's fantastic. I love the, uh, the, the story behind it that your grandmother used to make it and all that, right? So that's all yeah. part of our Malaysian heritage out we all have very unique, I think, very disparate types of like experiences growing up in Malaysia, but that's just what makes Malaysia really unique, right? It yeah, is. yeah, yeah. To, to me, there's nowhere better to grow up in Malaysia because your exposure to so many different cultures and the blending of those cultures and everybody is so open and welcoming into their own culture. So, you know, as a kid, what better place is there to grow up? It's It's like the world in a little microcosm and and of course the food <laughs> let's be honest yeah. it's, it's how the relations like to express their heritage through feeding through making beautiful food sharing it with each other and yeah it's it's an amazing place with amazing food and amazing people so 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 proud to be malaysian <laughs> you and me both all right Liam well thank you so much for this this looks amazing like I said guys if you want this recipe you need to sign up malaysianchefs.com slash join today and also if you're watching this live don't forget we are running a competition uh, we are offering some giveaways and you can check them out at malaysianchefs.com slash momc hyphen giveaways so make sure you check that out you've got the uh, Liam you're going to offer a keyword for this and the keyword for your session is lemak. Oh, lemak. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. It's high with your good laksa. Choice. Yeah, lemak. <laughs> okay. So there you go, guys. If you're watching this live, uh, lemak is the keyword you want to get uh, an extra entry for, and increase your chances at winning in the competition. And we'll post the competition link in the comments so that you guys can go and check it out if you haven't already signed up to it. All right. Well, thanks again very much, Liam. And I shall see you. you. I shall yeah, see you next great. time. Thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. I loved it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. And yeah. We love having please, you. <laughs> please, please try your recipes. Go to your granny. Find out from her what she's making because, yeah, you want to learn these things. 
<laughs> All right, right here. Thanks again, Liam, and we will see you again soon. Ciao. Bye.